Good morning once again. I'm very uh, happy that uh, I can see my dear colleagues um, Val, Balash and Tommaso uh, this morning uh, with us. Thank you for uh, joining us on the second day of our conference dealing with uh, civic space uh, in um, European Union, but also um, in, in wider Europe, um, because we will be focusing on that today um, um, as well. Um, today's uh, uh, first panel um, is about your responses to uh, shrinking, uh, shrinking civic space. Um, yesterday um, we spoke we spoke about uh, the issues um, with the narrowing uh, civic space uh, on the level of the European Union, but uh, we um, made a sort of an inventory of a few of the EU uh, member states, uh, Poland, Slovenia, uh, Croatia and uh, Romania. Uh, from where we heard um, some of the similarities that civil societies uh, in these countries are, are facing, um, but also some of the uh, um, um, warnings of uh, where we wouldn't like um, um, uh, the rest of the EU countries uh, to be, for instance, like uh, the, the problems that Poland is, um, and is facing. The second panel was... Um, um, uh, devoted to uh, problems of uh, slabs. This is a topic that is being on the um, agenda of the um, of the um, um, of the European um, policymakers for um, uh, some time um, now. But usually we uh, we hear about slaps against journalists, which are under uh, biggest um, uh, threat uh, or or biggest victims of slaps. But we shouldn't forget about human rights defenders and wider uh, wider uh, civil society organizations who are also. Um, targeted by um, uh, by slaps, and this is a problem that has to be addressed uh, holistically um, uh, in in and in that way. Um, the second, the third panel, or the first panel of of today, uh, is devoted to. Uh, um, opening up because we won't have enough time to go into details about everything but opening uh, uh, up the discussion um, about EU responses to shrinking uh, civic space the the closure of, of of civic space and attacks against human rights defenders are not from yesterday uh, in the in the EU um, we are all witnessing them uh, for um, for years even decades um, now uh, with uh, um, these attacks growing in, 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 in number, civic space um, uh, closing um, and narrowing, the EU was uh, mounting up its um, response slowly but gradually. Um, and today uh, in its toolbox, um, it has um, a number of, of, of tools that are uh, better or less better or uh, uh, um, uh, more sharp or less sharp uh, for um, uh, for um, uh, stopping the, uh, the the narrowing of civic space um, and um, hopefully uh, bringing the um, uh, bringing the, um, uh, the the change um, and this is our task today to basically uh, see um, what is out there um, what is useful, what is not useful, how we can, and most importantly, how we can uh, make it um, uh, better. Um, we are not going to focus today only on the EU member states. We are also going to look in our backyard uh, in the Western um, the Balkans. Um, and uh, that's why we have Tommaso today um, uh, with us to, uh, to see what is going on with civic space in, in these countries and uh, how maybe EU can learn something from what is it doing outside of its border uh, to uh, put it in um, uh, inside. Uh, but that is enough for me uh, uh, in the introductory part because I'm uh, very close to uh, being a panelist um, once again, and this is not my job today. I have a pleasure uh, to, um, uh, to uh, um, uh, pass the floor to our first speaker today which is Waltrud Heller from Fundamental Rights uh, Agency um, uh, of the European Union. Uh, while leads the, the Fras work on civic space and the rule of law, uh, she joined the NGC pre precursor organization, the European Monitoring Center on Racism and Xenophobia in 2005 as a communication officer. 
and later became the agency spokesperson. From 2014 until recently, she coordinated FRA's civil society network, the fundamental rights platform. Since 2016, Val built, um, uh, built up FRA's work on civic uh, space. Prior joining FRA, she worked as a communicator, among others, for the European Trade Union Confederation and uh, for the development cooperation NGOs. She was also a speechwriter for European Commissioner. Her areas of expertise include civil, uh, civil society development, civic space, communication, and participatory engagement. I cannot imagine the better person to kick off with um, uh, where we are, what is out there, how do you assess the situation? Please, while well, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ivan, and thanks for the invitation. Um, good morning, everyone, and greetings from Vienna. Yeah, it's a difficult task. You give me, I think, seven minutes to, to do that. Maybe just to say that, indeed, um, for a long time, civic space was something that was regarded as something that happens outside the EU. For inside the EU, the focus came really late. And Ivan, you said it that since decades there have been attacks, but somehow there was a blind spot or blind eye inside the EU. But this has changed. And I think since about five years, more and more voices, both from civil society and then also from the Fundamental Rights Agency and increasingly also other institutional actors are recognizing the problems and are, have started developing solutions. And of course, uh, you said it slowly, but, but gradually, and I, I would agree with that. So um, maybe to start with, um, so the agency has worked on civic space since 2016 and only inside the EU because inside EU is our mandate. And we are publishing a report every year since 2018. And what do we see? So we, when we started this work, we got together with civil society organizations and tried to, to, to check. And at the moment, at that time, there weren't so many working on this. There was Civicus mostly, and then some others. And we tried to see what are the potential challenges for civil society in the EU. And we came up with a mind map of 60, 60 different potential issues. And the mind map, when we look at it today, it hasn't really changed. What has changed is that more of these issues are being experienced by more organizations in more countries. Um, and so we clustered these. And the cluster uh, that we use is four areas. So the first one is the legal environment, the laws that have an impact on civil society's functioning. The second is the access to resources. The third is uh, the access to decision making, participation, consultation. And the fourth is threats and attacks, um, and looking into all, all types of attacks from smear campaigns to online hate and, and physical attacks. Um, and so what we see is that indeed, as you said, there are challenges, and there are challenges actually in all EU member states along these, these four clusters. Of course, the intensity of the challenges and, and the type, it varies in the member states. But there are still similar patterns, and that's why I think it's important to tackle them and to learn from each other, um, to tackle them together. And I think also this is why your conference is really important, to connect the learnings and the knowledge. So how is the topic situated today on the agenda of the EU institutions? We've heard it took a while, but today, I think, from the side of EU, there are three perspectives. The first is the civic space across the European Union. So in a comparative way, looking at all the countries. And there, okay, we've had the fundamental rights agency reports for a while. We also had the economic and social committee working on single issues for a long time. I remember the first hearing that I participated in was on, on access to funding, EU funding, which was in 2017. But then the other institutions came, followed, let's say. Um, so we had the European Parliament, uh, which uh, published a report or resolution, but officially it's called a report, earlier this year in February. So you see the how long it takes for things to materialize, to manifest in, in action. I think there has been a lot of thinking on single issues before, but now I think we are in this year actually where it, there is a tipping point on really having the, the full attention of policymakers at the EU level. Because now in December, we will have the European Commission public, publicizing for the, for the first time a report on civic space as the Commission. So they have an annual report on the application of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. 
and in December they will publish a report focusing on civic space. And uh, next year, um, the Council um, of the EU is uh, aiming to produce Council conclusions on civic space. Then we also have the rule of law report of the European Commission. And I think we will go in this a bit later, so I will not focus now. And then, of course, we have the new citizens' equality rights and values funding since about two years, where gradually also in terms of funding, the EU is aligning more to the needs of civil society under pressure. So this is the first the, at the EU level. The second thing that the EU looks at is single issues of concern in individual member states. And there, of course, the EU is, is a bit limited because the EU can only act in the area of legal EU competence. But where this is the case, the EU is, for example, doing infringement procedures against specific countries. For example, there were two infringement procedures against Hungary on the NGO law and on foreign funding. We also see that uh, the anti slap legislation and an association statute, which is more to tackle issues at, at the national level. And the third that is often forgotten, the third area is civic space at, uh, by the EU itself limitations. So I mean, when EU institutions are not acting in a way that really is creating a fully enabling space. So at the EU level, what we see is that there are, of course, no intentional attacks on civil society, but um, <clears throat> I think there are maybe mainly two issues that we see. The one is that, so the EU has a specific article in, in the treaties on civil dialogue. So dialogue between the EU institutions and civil society. And we see that the implementation of that dialogue is really patchy. Um, so there is no processes in place. Of course, there is dialogue, but it's not, not very structured, let's say. <clears throat> and then the second point is that sometimes there are unintended side effects of EU legislation on civil society. So EU legislation normally is, has to be depending on which type of legislation, but often has to be transposed in national law. And we see that the transposition of the anti-money laundering directive, the over-implementation has created problems for civil society in some member states. And also the facilitation directive has created problems for, for organizations helping with refu helping refugees, especially in the, in the Mediterranean, because there is, the, depending on how you interpret it, it could be uh, regarded as an illegal activity. So the, the EU level is not as severe, as at the national level, but it is also a blind spot. And maybe to conclude, three points um, to recall. So EU can act on civic space in the area of EU competence. The second point is that I think we should also not forget is that for the EU as a whole, there are also other international organizations who are working on all these countries. So that's the, the OECD may be a bit of an unlikely actor, but the OECD has started working really very determined on open government and on civic space. And they will soon publish their first report on civic space. They call it a global study on civic space, but it basically covers almost all EU member states as well. Then the OSCE and the ODIR, who have repeatedly worked also on building the capacity, but on they do country visits also to assess the civic space in countries. Then the Council of Europe, and there, of course, mostly the Commission for Human Rights, who, who is very vocal on civic space issues. And then the United Nations, and in particular, the special rapporteurs. On, there are several special rapporteurs. I will not go into detail here, but just to say that EU organizations, in my observation, often forget that these UN, UN mechanisms can also used from inside, be used from inside the EU. Um, and there's a new one uh, on environmental defenders, by the way, as well. And they all have different mandates, so they can complement each other. So um, what we have done is, so the Fundamental Rights Agency, together with ODIR, we started an informal contact group among all these peoples in the different international organizations who work on with civil society, human rights defenders issues. And we meet several times each year just to exchange and to hear what, what the different actors are doing and how we can maybe help each other. And the last point I wanted to make in this opening round is, we've said before that 
EU externally does a lot of things for civil society. There is guidelines on human rights defenders. There is a CSO meter to assess um, civic space, but all of this happens externally and not internally. And so from the fundamental rights agency perspective, we think it's very important that there will be more coherence between the approach of dealing with civic space externally and internally, including in terms of flexibility of funding, etc. So I will leave it at that for now, uh, but we can we can follow up later. Thank you. Thank you, Val, for this comprehensive overview of what is out there, non, not only on the level of the EU, but on the level of the other um, international uh, organizations. I think it is really important for us to be reminded about, about all of these tools and have it somewhere in our mind map, as you were saying before, when you map the, the, the 60 areas of, of uh, where, where there might be problems for uh, CSOs, I think it's important for us to have that in mind and try to use these forums as much as possible to uh, to advance our cause. And thank you for mentioning the coherence part of the EU works inside and outside. That would be a good intro for Tommaso, to whom we will go uh, after uh, Balash, uh, Balash, thank you for uh, for being here with us. Uh, and um, I think you're the best person to speak after Val, not because uh, there is a there there is a difference in value, but Val was presenting us from the perspective of the independent institution, but still um, uh, uh, from the institution. And um, I think it's great that you are with us because you have a um, um, you have an experience of working in Hungary, but you also. Uh, have an experience and very good overview of what uh, human rights civil society uh, is uh, is doing and facing in 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 different uh, in different um, uh, countries. Let me just introduce you properly. So Balas is Hungarian human rights activist who lives and works in Berlin. Currently, he leads Liberties and EU focused and EU focused civil rights a uh, civil liberties watchdog and network, which among other issues focuses on rule of law and civic space in the EU. Prior to Liberties, Balash worked for the Open Society Foundations and with different Hungarian human rights um, NGOs. Balash, the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ivan. Can you hear me? Great. So uh, I have to uh, correct you. I, I, I'm not the perfect or the best person to talk after Val because of at least two reasons. First of all, it's, it's a kind of difficult task to uh, talk after her because she's such a knowledgeable person <laughs> on this issue. Uh, uh, the second is that the uh, the best person to uh, to to address uh, your conference would be my colleagues dealing with civic space. I'm, you know, I'm substituting uh, my colleague Linda Ravo and and Yasha Galeski, but I'm very happy to be here and thank you for the invitation. I would like to start with a kind of uh, two general remarks. Both of um, them were somehow addressed by. Uh, by you, Ivan, and, and also by Val. The first is on the uh, the fact that the EU is a slow machine. The, you know, very often we compare it to a very big boat which turns, which takes uh, you know uh, many time to uh, to turn. But I have to uh, point out that civic space as an issue, uh, and and what's more, even as, as a term, is not that uh, not that old. You know, of course there have been decades uh, of attacks against different uh, you know civil society actors in many many countries in and outside of Europe. But uh, let us all remind that the, the first uh, you know foreign agent Russian law, uh, which is a kind of uh, infamous piece of legislation in this field, was adopted in 2012 only. Uh, and you know now, ten years later, here we are. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that by now, the civic space uh, as an issue uh, kind of penetrated the entire EU agenda. Like all EU institutions, in one way or another, are dealing with it. So I think that's that's actually a good thing from a civil society perspective. Uh, and the second remark is um, is the fact that uh, you know civic space restrictions are always almost always coming from state or on governments or in some cases of course from corporations or or big tech uh, you know of course there are uh, different uh, um, you know civic space issues related directly to the eu as well uh, correctly identify them but in most cases when we are talking about real restrictions real abuses real problems and real obstacles they are actually originated in the member state. And the situation uh, in which we are regarding a supranational actor, the European Union, to solve all these problems might lead us to a false uh, conclusion. So I, I would like to uh, point out that it's actually good to be realistic when we ask the question, 
what can the EU do to protect uh, civic space? There are many things, of course. You know, one answer is to um, try to create a, a, an environment which is more friendly and more enabling. Uh, it also can contribute to the, uh, the overall strengthening of civil society. This is probably the most important uh, the EU uh, could and should do. But probably the most adequate answer is that you know, countering shrinking civic space is, is mostly about creating organizations which are able to be resilient, uh, you know, and, and that's, what, what, that's what we need to see what the EU could and should do in that respect. You know, you know if I, um, if I want to use my time to go through the different uh, EU institutions, what are the open, ongoing and past initiatives, you know, this, this would be, uh, instead of a seven to 10 minute presentation, this would be uh, hours and hours. So it just really just uh, just uh, you know flashing some of the ongoing issues. Of course, if we uh, examine the different actors, it's very often the European Parliament, which is seen you know from the Council, the Commission, and the Parliament, which is seen as probably the most um, uh, you know <laughs> progressive body in this. It's, it's no surprise, you know, this is the only directly elected political body, and very often members of the Parliament are in you know more active contact with members of civil society because these are people who almost always have to think about their real actions so <laughs> i don't want to be more cynical than uh, than i am but it's understandable so it's no uh, wonder that you know very often ep resolutions are taking a more progressive <laughs> uh, lead than than in other eu bodies and as well uh, pointed out the um, uh, you know earlier this year the ep adopted resolution which actually included uh, a, a strong suggestion of adopting a European statute on associations was, was a good one. Now, the good news is that some of these ideas are actually making true and, uh, you know, convincing the Commission that, you know, this is the way to move forward. So, you know, one, you know, uh, kind of pretty recent development is that uh, when in October uh, uh, this year, the Commission published the uh, you know, 2023 verb program, uh, you know, there is actually something about the European statutes. So, you know, it's promised that by Q3 uh, 2023, the Commission will somehow, uh, you know, put the question of European statute of associations on the table. Now, I, I think it's, again, I will mention this several times, it's it's good to be realistic. This, this won't be an overall game changer. This won't be a magic, you know, uh, tool which will solve all the problems, but it's it's important to uh, follow this process because for some organizations this could provide a safe space for uh, 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 and especially if uh, this piece of uh, planned legislation will have will will somehow find a solution for you know the charitable status. How can organizations registered under the the you know the future legislation if that happens uh, still enjoy charitable status in in the member state then it, then it could be an important piece of legislation <clears throat> now i will of course talk about the uh, the commission uh, uh, next but let me mention that you know the organization which we really uh, should credit in this work is is the fundamental rights agency you know many many believe that uh, the 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 fra is is in on on, on many issues is seen as a toothless lion and uh, although uh, you know it's a, it's a, it's a great institution in term, in terms of providing ideas and and uh, and and platform for discussions and also the quality of the documents produced by the agency are you know uh, uh, really a really important uh, make making them really important resources but i think in this uh, respect it's very important to uh, acknowledge that you know the fra uh, for the last uh, 6 years did a lot to push this issue through different eu institutions and we have to acknowledge that you know not only policy papers you know the last uh, fundamental rights platform meeting all entirely dedicated to civic space uh, and all this these are extremely important resources for uh, uh, for us so if i uh, if i see what the commission uh, uh, does we will talk about the rule of law report uh, in the second round, so I don't want to uh, use that. I think it's a uh, 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 it's it's a very important symbolic gesture from the Commission that they promised that uh, you know December 10th they will publish the Civic Space Paper. Uh, you know December 10th is of course World Human Rights Day, uh, and you know these gestures do matter. So you know I think <laughs> we are uh, at a point when when <clears throat> not only uh, members of or <laughs> you know, kind of bubble human rights community, but externals also recognize that the rights of NGOs are, you know, fundamentally important when protecting fundamental rights. So this is this is a good thing. How strong the paper will be, we don't know. Of course, liberties and its members were, 
you know, taking part in the consultation and we, we, we you know, we, we were pushing our ideas, we will see that we should um, be aware that this paper and the promised, um, you know, council uh, uh, civil society uh, 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 paper and also uh, what we heard from the Swedish presidency and this are not substituting for a full-fledged civil society strategy, which many actors are asking for, but these are important, uh, you know, uh, first steps. Now, you know, uh, maybe just um, a few other things on, on money issues. Uh, you know, while already mentioned the underserved, uh, <laughs> the citizens equality rights and values uh, strand, I think it's very important to um, note that the, uh, the, the actual uh, seven years multiannual financial framework is providing significantly more resources uh, for NGOs from this uh, from this source than before. You know, you know, the previous 2014 to 2020 uh, program. Even if I combine uh, the rights equality and citizenship program with the Europe for Citizens program, you know, that was uh, 650 million uh, euros for seven years, and now we are talking about 1.5, actually uh, even more. So 1.5 uh, billion euros. That's that's a significant uh, increase. What is even better that uh, you know we see the Commission funding to move uh, to the direction where uh, you know very often, especially in problematic member states, um, they are actually giving directly uh, money to NGOs, not only to service providers, but they are actually giving money to aggregators and 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 selecting organizations to regrant. You know, in the light of ongoing negotiations uh, with the Commission, between the Commission and the government of Hungary. I think it's a very significant piece of news that a few uh, days ago, a consortium of Hungarian uh, foundations was awarded uh, more than 4 million euros. And this is direct money from the commission <laughs> to uh, Hungarian NGOs to protect uh, EU values and, and, and human rights. So, you know, these things actually do matter. The other uh, uh, important point, which is also money related and commission related, you know, it took some years, but it seems to me that the EU is seemingly finding its voice on rule of law and, and, and fundamental rights violations issue. You know, I'm, I'm using this, uh, the rule of law uh, term, because it's, it, by now we can actually, you know, um, really, really see that um, the rights of NGOs and civic space is part of uh, the rule of law framework. And then in this respect, I think it's significant that, you know, first with the uh, recovery funds, then with the rule of law conditionality mechanism, and then uh, since mid-October, it actually even more significantly, you know, with the structural funds, uh, we see the European Commission raising its voice. You know, uh, what's happening with Hungary, with the recovery fund and, and the rule of law conditionality that would take um, not an hour, but a two days long conference, but what is what is absolutely very relevant uh, was the Commission's note on Poland, uh, uh, you know, from uh, mid October this year, when they said that the Commission is threatening the withdrawal and suspension of billions of euros of, from the structural funds to um, to Poland because of non-complying with the fundamental rights charter. This is major, you know. This is <clears throat> this is when. <laughs> and, uh, uh, for many, many reasons, uh, you know, one of them is very practical and political. Here, the council is not even uh, asked to, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, to comply. I know I'm I'm out of my time, so really, just you know, one minute. I'm very sorry uh, for everyone. I think it's extremely uh, important that we as civil society uh, organizations would recognize those uh, advocacy opportunities which are seemingly directly not connected to civic space but then in the case of adoption you know they will have significant influence of what are we doing and i would mention you know uh, two three digital rights related issues you know the digital services act which most of our organizations are not dealing with is actually coming into force next year will be a full year of the digital services act and there is something in that act which uh, which is pretty interesting that uh, you know it should include the risk assessments um, of, of how these very large online platforms uh, are uh, having an effect on the civic discourse. This is in the DSA. Now, civic discourse per se is not, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, identified what exactly it means, but it will be all responsibility to fill this with content with the commission. And there are other, uh, you know, ongoing pieces of legislation, you know, the digital Magna Carta, as many, many call, the European Declaration on Digital Rights and and principles for the digital decade is also about the fundamental rights of citizens. So I think 
it's it's all responsibility to fill this with 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 content thank you thank you balash for mapping all of these issues that um are to most of us not even you know at, at, at the, on a map because we are a bit a little bit far from it because it's too many things are happening uh, at once but i think it's extremely important that we have this conference today and that we have you all of you as speakers to bring what's happening on the eu level level uh, a little bit closer to the national to the national um, uh, context and although uh, it is hard to you know uh, um, to work on these um, um, issues for organizations uh, um, uh, in country like uh, like Croatia, I really do hope that another important thing that you mentioned that CERF program will facilitate building our capacities to uh, uh, be part of some of these um, um, uh, processes. It is really important that NGOs from all around the Europe participate in it, and you know that that the voices um, are um, um, uh, are heard. Um, so thanks for that. Um, we'll stop for a moment with uh, with, with with focusing on the uh, internally on on the EU, and we will go to Tommaso uh, to hear what's happening uh, in our backyard uh, in um, in in Western um, the Balkans. Uh, Tommaso is a civil rights defenders representatives in a representative in Brussels. He is in charge of the organization's relations with the European Union and of monitoring of the EU institution stance on human rights in all of these CRD target countries, which I think when it comes to the Western Balkans is the most of the Western Balkans countries, if not the, um, um, the all. Uh, he holds the LLM in International Law and University uh, from Edinburgh and MSc in Law from uh, Bocconi University. Before joining a, a CRD in September 2018, Tommaso worked for unrepresented nations and people's organization for four years. He also had brief experience at the European Commission and the Italian Embassy in The Hague, and has held several volunteering positions in a peace um, uh, education uh, youth organization, CISV. Tommaso, thank you for joining us um, uh, today, and please take the floor. Thanks, Ivan. I hope you can hear me well, and uh, thanks a lot for inviting civil rights defenders to this panel. Um, I'll start with a disclaimer that I hope the connection will hold. While Balaj was delivering his speech, I got a couple of notifications saying that it was unstable. I'm in a hotel in Tirana, so I'm doing my best. Um, so the Western Balkans, if I if I had to give a, a short answer and I only had 15 seconds, I would probably say that, yes, there is definitely a problem of shrinking space uh, for civil society in the Western Balkans as well, uh, comparable to that that happens uh, within the EU. Um, and a lot of what has been said today, but also in the panels yesterday for the EU also applies in the region. Um, the situation, of course, is different in each of the Western Balkan countries. As Ivan uh, said, we, we work on uh, on more or less the whole region. Uh, but there are for sure very similar trends and commonalities. Uh, I would say in general, civil society is allowed to register and operate. Um, before the foreign agents law in Russia was mentioned, we're not at all at that level for now. And even demonization of foreign funding in general is still at a very early stage, so to say. Um, most NGOs actually live thanks to or also thanks to some uh, sort of foreign funding. A lot of it comes from the EU or its member states. Um, but there are some trends that are starting, and especially in Serbia, we have seen this label of foreign agents uh, used by a few politicians, uh, although for now, let's say informally, not, not in legislation. Um, so just to give a quick run through some of the problems before I move to the EU action, um, depending on the area of work, civil society and media uh, face different levels of opposition uh, from government. Um, there are different formal and informal methods for this, pressures and strategies to restrict and constrain their work. Um, and also citizens struggle to defend their civil and political rights. Some examples, of course, are intimidations of journalists, slaps. I know you had a whole panel about that yesterday. Um, smear campaigns, restrictions and limitations to freedom of association and pressures on HRDs. Uh, and of course, the decrease of funding as well. Legislation in the Western Balkans is generally uh, quite good in many areas related to human rights, uh, freedoms, and anything that is uh, connected to the EU enlargement. Um, this applies to laws and decrees, but actually also to some strategies that are put in place to address the situation of minorities, LGBTI, Roma, etc. 
um, with uh, with exceptions in general, governments and parliaments in the region over the last decades have done a lot to try to please the EU, uh, so to say, for what concerns the legislative process um, and to adapt legislation to the EU a key. Um, the problem is that very often this is not met by appropriate implementation. Uh, strategies are not budgeted, rules are not followed, uh, and follow-up is done in a, in a quite limited way. Um, CSOs or investigative media that call out these inconsistencies are either harshly attacked, uh, generally, luckily, it's only verbally, uh, with smear campaigns, intimidations, or, as I mentioned, slaps, uh, or ignored, left alone, calling in the desert in the corner. Um, freedom of assembly, although it formally recognized everywhere, is adapted from time to time by governments, depending on whether the assembly or protest is something that they support or, or that they resist. Uh, for example, the first prides, uh, prides that were organized in Sarajevo uh, required additional security personnel tools and measures that were at the expense of the organizers, which had not happened for uh, other events of a similar size. Um, then to, to go to everyone's favorite topic, uh, COVID-19, like in many places in the Balkans, there were a number of restrictions and the first wave is actually, I would say, more severe on average than in uh, the rest of the, well, than in the EU. Um, and even though we can say that they were justified by the health situation or by the uncertainty, um, there have definitely been abuses by government of, of these restrictions and of the state of emergency. Um, a sad example to give a concrete one is how in May 2020, the Albanian authorities used the fact that you could not protest uh, outdoors to, to demolish the Tirana National Theatre, which had been, let's say, an ongoing discussion nationally. Um, and another example is, again, freedom of assembly, where certain gatherings related to political campaigning or anyway government endorsed initiatives were allowed to proceed, while uh, in theory you could not assemble for, for private reasons and NGOs were restricted in this. Um, and the state of emergency as well was abused and prolonged multiple times, similar to, similarly to what we saw in other countries and actually even within the EU. Um, to conclude on COVID, uh, even though now, I mean, the pandemic is, is largely over in terms of restrictions, some processes actually never went back to normal. An example from Albania is that uh, court hearings are still in some cases restricted. Journalists and civil society that monitor these trials cannot access. Um, so let's say it's been a comfortable excuse also in the longer term, unfortunately. What role does the EU play? Um, so the EU potentially has a very significant role to play for, for enlargement countries and so on, shrinking space as well. If things went by the book, I would say that uh, the EU could have a very significant impact on the region. There is, uh, as you, I'm sure you're, you know, there's a very hands-on approach led by DGNIR and by the delegations on the ground, uh, but that in reality, the enlargement process gives more or less all institutions uh, an increased power of scrutiny on, uh, on legislation and on human rights. Uh, the whole point of the enlargement process is to bring countries' legislation uh, in line with uh, the EU key and with European values. Uh, of course, in particular, chapters 23 and 24 are the ones that concern uh, these types of uh, topics. Um, as I mentioned, this has been quite successful when it comes to legislation. Uh, in many cases, actually, now the Western Balkans have um, better, more modern and more specific, precise laws than a number of their EU counterparts. Um, unfortunately, though, uh, this is not met by implementation. Um, I, I would say that compared to certain countries within the EU that are facing particularly significant problems of shrinking space, the fact that the EU has so much scrutiny uh, in the Western Balkans uh, gives them more power than within the EU. Actually, that's what led to some discussions. Maybe we let in some countries too soon, uh, because once you are a member state, there's much less power of scrutiny. Now some mechanisms are being introduced or perfected, but it's much more difficult to, to have a loud voice, especially because there is a vote in council, of course. Um, on, uh, on paper, many of the instruments that the EU has for the Western Balkans are, are therefore quite significant. Uh, the European Commission's annual progress reports are probably the best known and uh, most sophisticated instrument that the EU has. Um, and there is also a, a maybe less technical but more political uh, report by the European Parliament on each of the countries uh, every year that comments on the Commission one. And uh, European Parliament rapporteurs end up having a, quite a high profile in being known in the countries that are their responsibility and quite political, quite some political weight. Um, and I would say that then the other instrument, of course, that the EU has and its member states have uh, is funding. Um, there are very large amount of funds for for different purposes um, that can help in this direction. 
but I, I need to move to problems before I run out of time because I see I'm already at, at seven minutes. Um, I, I have outlined a list of problems that I think are, are hampering this power that the EU would potentially have. Uh, the first one that I see is a political one. Um, many political leaders in the Western Balkans are affiliated to the same political families of some of the political leaders within the EU. And this leads to, let's say, lower criticism and more care. It's a bit similar to what happened with the European People's Party protecting Viktor Orban for a very long time. This happens similarly with Mr. Vucic and the socialists and Democrats are very hesitant when it comes to criticizing Edi Rama, for example, in, in Albania. Uh, and of course, the fact that the Commissioner for Enlargement in the past few years has been um, a Hungarian has had an impact on this as well. The second problem is a geopolitical one. Uh, China, Russia and Turkey all try to play a role in the Western Balkans. Uh, the EU is aware of this and this has led sometimes the EU uh, to being too cautious um, at criticizing uh, national governments and in general what happens in the Western Balkans with fear that that would push them um, to, to look more at these players than at us, let's say. Um, the third problem is the lack of appetite for, for, for further enlargement um, within the European Union. Uh, a, a while ago, a Croatian MEP told us that Croatia took the last train to the EU. And even though I hope this is not true, I do think that it's much harder and much longer for, for the Western Balkan countries now to join. Um, the fourth problem is that the EU, uh, the EU's words, and specifically the EU Commission's reports, are um, very technical. The language that is used is ambiguous and sometimes contradictory. Uh, and there is a kind of box ticking approach that uh, doesn't ring very well sometimes with uh, with civil society on the ground. Um, the reports are very long and exhaustive, which is good, uh, but it also means that no one reads them, uh, at least not the general public. But also we've heard from many civil society partners on the ground that they are progressively taking distance from them. Um, and the fact that terms such as little progress or no progress are used so widely when actually there is backlash. Um, is uh, and in general the ambiguity is something that is not helpful and that allows government leaders to manipulate the message that the EU is giving and, and depict these reports as, as a success in some way. Um, the fifth problem is that even though these processes uh, have concrete ways in which civil society is encouraged to contribute, um, both uh, on the ground in the Western Balkans, but also in Brussels, there is limited follow up to uh, the inputs that we give. And when they're disregarded or even contradicted, it is impossible to know whether the disagreement is substantial, formal and, and why they have not been incorporated. Um, and additionally, civil society feels that they are mainly consulted either when uh, there are these annual consultations, so in a very, let's say, rigid way, or on the occasion of special visits, uh, but not considered um, a constant partner that the that they you should walk hand in hand with. And then the sixth, but uh, which is also the last, but definitely not least, is that um, there are a lot of concerns also regarding funding. Um, overall, in the past few years, the EU has decided to go uh, towards issuing fewer larger grants rather than many small grants, and this has had an impact on, on smaller NGOs who have uh, more problems accessing it. Um, also, due to transparency and other important principles, the, the requirements for reporting, etc., have been enhanced, um, and so, in practice, uh, project applications are more and more complex. There's more logistics, more reporting, more expertise required, more time required, which makes it increasingly difficult for organizations to, to access them. For all of these reasons, despite, I think, the good efforts of many individuals also who work for the EU institutions, the EU is being much less effective than it could and than it should be in its uh, mission to, to contra contrast this shrinking space. And I think I'll stop here for now. Thank you, Tommaso. Uh... Just a small reference to Croatian MEP. Uh, if he was thinking about train operated by, by Croatian uh, uh, railway, uh, then uh, yeah, that was probably the last train having in mind the state of the Croatian railway system. But let's hope that the train was operated at least by OBB or Deutsche Bahn, so it will it, it will manage to pull the rest of the region to the uh, to the EU soon. Uh, jokes aside, thank you for uh, this elaborate uh, uh, specification of, of of the problems. Um, at, at the end, I think they are um, very relevant for us to um, uh, to hear them, especially hearing them from Croatian um, um, uh, perspective. 
I have to recall the 2016 NRE liberal government uh, when um, we were proven uh, um, by the by, by by facts on on the ground that it would be much better if the European Commission and the Council insisted insisted on having some kind of a monitoring mechanism for Croatia, similar to Bulgaria or Romania, but not on the I mean on corruption as well, but also on, on fundamental rights. Probably that bleach could have been um, uh, avoided or at least there could are there is an argument out there that it could have been um, um, avoided thanks L let us go back now to um to inside of the EU as you see we are dancing at the border <laughs> um a little bit and um as uh, Val and Balash were um, you mentioned uh, before, we particularly wanted to focus um, um, uh, the, a part of this panel today on the rule of law uh, um, report. As uh, I mean, it's not completely new, but it's a fairly new uh, um, the mechanism that the uh, the European Commission is doing. I think is the, the this year is the fourth iteration, if I'm not, or the third uh, the third iteration. Uh, and it's um, and it's and and it's I mean um, a work in progress. Um, it is um, uh, it, it is growing. Um, some of us from um, from Croatian civil society participated um, uh, in in that report uh, from the beginning. I mean we even participated in, in in the advocacy. And it would be really interesting to to hear your assessment where we are, whether it's useful, uh, um, how we can make it. Uh, um, uh, a little bit um, better. What are the expectations um, 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 from it, both from the institutional point of view of of Ra as the independent uh, um, organization institution in, in in that way, but also from from you, Balash uh, Liberties. Uh, I, I believe that you coordinated the, the largest joint effort when it comes to uh, civil society input to um, uh, to the commission. So uh, you have a good overview of that as well. Well, uh, if you're okay with that, I, I would like us to start with you. Okay, thank you. So, about the rule of law report. So, that's a relatively new tool since three years. The Commission is publishing every year a report on the rule of law um, that has one general chapter for the overall rule of law and then one chapter per member state. And since this year, there are also recommendations for each member state specific to the member state. So I find it very interesting that we're discussing this in a, in a conference on civic space, because I think that's exactly where it belongs. But I also think that we have all taken some time to make that link, including the Commission itself. So the Commission doesn't see the rule of law report as a civic space tool. So if you would ask them, they, they would mention it. But basically, um, it's, a, it's a rule of law tool. And we are all learning, I think, how the rule of law and the civic space are interrelated and how they can also help each other. So um, the report has four chapters, covers four areas, um, the, the functioning of the justice system, anti-corruption, media freedom, and other checks and balances. And so the sort of the whole civic space questions would fall also under the other checks and balances. And I know that civil society have pushed to have a separate chapter on civic space um to make it more visible currently this is not the case so currently the civic space and civil society is covered uh, basically under this uh, checks and balances and also in a transversal matter so especially on the corruption for example there of course overlaps with the civic space um so on the question is it getting a better or stronger tool or how is it evolving I think it's really evolving over time, and I think, like like what we said before, it it's moving. Um, uh, you, Balas, you said the EU is a tanker, and uh, I think considering that tanker, I think it's moving rather fast, actually. So that they have recommendations now was not thinkable three years ago, and also I think what's very important to understand is that for me this is not, a, or also for the Commission, it's not about the report. The report is a hook to do many, many things. And, and even if you're asking, is it useful? I think it's really up to everyone, like to the different institutions, to civil society, to use it, to make it useful. Yeah, because there are different different steps here. So we have the report. Civil society can, and I, think, I know is using in some countries, the report as an advocacy tool saying, the EU also says, 
you know, it can strengthen your voice in, in pushing for certain issues. Um, there is an annual consultation uh, feeding into the report. Uh, fundamental rights agency, we are feeding in and we are actually feeding in a lot of civic space information. And I think in this way, we are also helping the Commission to see the relationship between the, the rule of law and the civic space. So if, if anyone is interested, um, so we published every year the civic space report and this year we published it in July. And it has a focus chapter on how civil society is contributing to the rule of law. We wanted to make that point because we wanted to show both to the Commission, but also to civil society itself, there is a really, really close link that we all, I think, still need to explore. So um, if you look at this report, so we, we did the research. We were not sure how civil society themselves would see they contribute to the rule of law. Um, and, and we did research and we did a consultation on that. And we saw really substantial contributions in nine different areas. I'm not going into detail here, but a lot of work that civil society do is actually directly contributing to the rule of law, but we all don't make that link, like access to justice, uh, participation in legislation, all of these things, they, there is direct link. Um, so the consultation, um, civil society can contribute and, and um, also the commission does a fact-finding visit to each country where civil society is also invited to bring the issues. Um, what's also an interesting element that is maybe not so much on the radar is that there is a peer review in the council. So the council of the EU, the member states, they talk about each other. So they, they talk about rule of law in the different countries. The, every year there are five countries being discussed. And next year is actually the year where for the first time the round is completed and each country will have been discussed. And I think it's really important um, to also here to not just point the finger to some countries where it's really not working, but also there are issues in each country. And in this way, it's possible also to create peer learning and also peer pressure of doing better. There are now new recommendations um, and the recommendations are very vague. Um, it's, there is nothing surprising, let's say, but it's again, I think a hook to do things as civil society to refer to the recommendations and the commission itself what they are trying to do uh, with the report but also with the recommendations is to start a debate on these issues and i think it's working it's working slowly but some years ago we would never have had a full civil society conference on the rule of law and we just had several actually there was one there were different ones, but organized by civil society, also by the agency. And I think this is exactly what needs to happen. We need to understand, all of us, how civic space, rule of law, democracy, fundamental rights, how they interrelate and how they also support each other. And what are the acupuncture points that we can press to make the system work as a whole? And so the commission has asked the fundamental rights agency to help them with developing national rule of law dialogues. So this is dialogues to create exactly that debate. So such a dialogue can either be a public event to raise the general awareness, but where we are mostly pushing as FRA is a dialogue between the different actors who, who have a stake in the rule of law at the national level. So we just had a dialogue in Germany where Balaj was there actually, where we discussed about the whole report uh, with civil society, ministries, the judiciary, media associations, trade unions, so really to bring the system together. And it was surprising for us actually to hear that they, at the end of the workshop, they told us it was so helpful because they never had discussed in this multi-stakeholder setting, the rule of law for their country. And I think this is exactly what we need to do. We need to find the allies on rule of law in each country, connect them, make them work together and push for the issues. The next Commission Rule of Law Dialogue actually will happen in Croatia in January. And uh, we are already working on this, uh, where in Croatia it will focus not on the whole report, but only on the justice system, uh, because there seems to be enough to discuss in a half day workshop on this. And we will again bring together the whole system. Um, yeah, uh, maybe just to conclude, I think. The rule of law is so important for civic space because there is a there is basically a double link so for civil society and the media 
and, and wider yeah, civic engagement to be able to contribute to fundamental rights and to the rule of law, uh, the civic space must be open and secure. But a functioning rule of law can also help us create that open civic space. So therefore, because of this strong connection, it's really important that civil society, like Balash said, finds the, the advocacy points and finds the interconnectedness and becomes active on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Val. Uh, and thank you for underlining this, um, uh, this, uh, this connection. Um, we could actually see how some of the uh, 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 inputs that Fra was giving to uh, Commission on Civic Space actually uh, go, landed there much better than from civil society. So uh, agency is um, uh, is a real ally and friend in in in, in that process in that process as well. But I have to um, um, recall what Yono Tsibian yesterday said as well. That is extremely important also to uh, uh, engage more uh, civil society actors to, actors to use this uh, mechanism as well for their voices to be heard because we also know that the commission responds to numbers um, as well. Uh, so that is important. And once again, I really hope that the CERF will facilitate that because right now there is no capacity um, 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 for it, uh, at least in Croatian civil society. And I bet uh, that the situation is even worse in, in, in some, um, uh, some, um, uh, some other countries. Balash, uh, this is a good schlagwort for um, 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 uh, intro uh, for you. Please proceed. Thank you. Uh, you know, Liberty is also a lobby very heavily uh, for, the, um, for um, an internal uh, monitoring process uh, on, on rule of law. I, I don't want this to create uh, to be, uh, you know, the same when after the war everyone was a partisan. Uh, but but really, you know, this is something uh, from the very establishment of liberties. We pushed very strongly. We said that if the EU is strong, uh, not only with resources but also with monitoring on the you know potential candidate countries and in the neighbor, direct neighborhood, then you know how on earth is possible that within the uh, union, there is no, you know, systemic monitoring of rule of law situations. So in that respect, we think um, it's a very important step. Uh, of course, you know, again, let's be realistic. It is what it is. It is a monitoring exercise, uh, you know, with recommendations. Uh, but I think uh, the situation is improving. Uh, first of all, you know, this is the third, this, this year was the third uh, report. I think it's getting better and better. From the civic space perspective, yes, there is no uh, independent chapter on civic space. I believe, uh, you know, it's, it's a kind of catch of 22. You know, if I say I believe there will be, it also mean an implication that the situation will further deteriorate. So, you know, maybe it's better to hope that there won't be a civic space chapter. Uh, but there are more and more space dedicated on civic space issues within the, the report. That's pretty clear if we uh, take it into uh, you know, a kind of comparative uh, uh, analysis. The, the other thing is that I think it's a very good development that for this year, for the first time, there were, as well mentioned, there were country specific recommendations. You know, this is how it should be. Now, the important thing is now, you know, if you have recommendations on specific member states, of course, you have to monitor, you know, uh, monitor the implementation of those recommendations, because if you just recommend uh, things and you don't um, examine it, how the member states are you know dealing with those recommendations then you know it will be empty words so that's important the country consultations yes indeed the uh, the first uh, pilot uh, maybe i think it's, it's it was a pilot in germany was was good it was kind of um, really eye opening for us to realize that so many german civil servants uh, and so many ngos <laughs> realized that this was the first time when they got together in one room this is, um, you know, I wouldn't call absurd, but it's kind of very interesting uh, that, you know, it, it takes the European Commission and it takes the fundamental rights agency to bring these actors together in one room to start a constructive dialogue. So that was a good thing. Now, my fear is that these country consultations will be more relevant in member states where, you know, the governments and state actors uh, you know, traditionally are taking uh, NGOs and civil society more seriously. And I have the feeling that in the in the real bad Apple member states, 
you know, I don't have to name them because all of us know uh, which ones they are, you know, this will be a little bit more problematic to bring together uh, public servants, uh, uh, you know, high level government officials and members of civil society into, into the same room. Uh, but let's see how that goes. Uh, so, so that's good. I think, uh, you know, what was said, this is a, the report is, and the process is a hook. I fully agree. It's not only a hook for NGOs, uh, uh, it's also a hook for the commission itself. You know, it, uh, the systematic monitoring presents the foundations and the ground uh, for the commission uh, to, you know, to turn to rule of law issues when they want to use those issues to criticize certain member states. You know, without, um, without an EU-wide uh, monitoring process, it would be very, um, politically, it would be very risky to uh, name and shame countries and to say that, you know, we do this because Hungary and Poland is bad on this, you know, but they will say that, well, why only us? You know, why not? So, you know, it, it gives a very good kind of political uh, basis for, you know, using these um, issues for uh, other procedures. So that's that's a good thing. But it's also a hook for media. You know, I recall the, uh, uh, the you know, for NGOs to go to the media with these issues, you know, the uh, when uh, Liberties is a, uh, uh, you know, kind of we take it seriously, so we lobby, lobbied for this, and now we are uh, year after year we are producing. You know, this is I'm quoting the commission, the most comprehensive and uh, and detailed NGO shadow report uh, as part of the consultation process. Uh, you know, we covered last year 15 countries. This this year, uh, 18 18 countries. This is really a big uh, uh, work. Uh, but it, it sh you know, it, it brings the results. So, you know, very often, especially uh, as we are using a kind of attractive, you know, improvement, uh, no improvement, uh, you know, situation worsening type of traffic light system, green, red and, and yellow. This is very attractive for the media. So we are going to places with this, uh, you know, report and not only us, but other NGOs or partner NGOs from Spain to the Netherlands are getting media coverage because of this contribution, which would be, uh, would be very complicated. So that's, I think, a good thing. Now, what could be done better? You know, uh, there is always uh, space to improve all kinds of report. One thing was already mentioned by Tommaso, not in the, not uh, related to the rule of law report, but in, in general, but I think it's true for that too. You know, commission must make an effort to make the language more accessible because at the moment it's very technical. Now I understand that most uh, voters and uh, parts of the general public won't start uh, their days with, you know, uh, with coffee and the rule of law report, that, that's fine. But it, but it, you know, there must be a, a golden, you know, middle way of finding somehow, you know, an accessible executive, uh, executive, uh, uh, you know, summary or some kind of, you know, translation from uh, a bureaucratic lingo to a uh, plain, plain language, uh, and not only because this would allow the commission more visibility that they do this, but also because one of the most crucial uh, objectives for NGOs and for everyone working on this issue should be to make uh, uh, the, you know, to disseminate the news about this work more, uh, 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 you know, to, with, with a more effective reach out, you know, none of the actors, the commission, the NGOs and the academics will be successful to disseminate information and achieving, uh, you know, real results if we are not able to, uh, you know, to, to develop messages and let the general public understand that the rule of law and civic space are not some abstract terms, but it's about their daily uh, uh, life. And it, in that, it's not only the commission which bears responsibility, you know, it would be actually uh, surprising if this document would be fundamentally different from other, you know, commission papers, policy papers and other documents, but also NGOs, you know, it's, uh, you know, we do have the responsibility, which is why Liberties and uh, its partners strongly believe in in, in something if it's called value-based communication to make, you know, the human rights related messages more accessible uh, and improve our, you know, uh, uh, messaging um, and, and make us more uh, effective. So, you know, you know my, my, my uh, suggestions are these uh, language, more effective communication and, and make, continue the process and make it broader and, and, and really uh, you know, follow, follow and monitor the implementation of recommendations. 
uh, maybe this was just the first year with country specific recommendations, but you know, if there will be several years and no follow up on that, then you know, the process will be a little bit uh, empty. But otherwise, I think it's a very good exercise and I think it's a, it's a very good start and it's a very good political and legal basis for certain uh, uh, other procedures. Thank you, Balash. I completely uh, agree with you. It's a great uh, opportunity for, for all of us to advance the overall human rights and rule of law um, agenda, and we don't have that much of opportunities, honestly, so there is really not an option to uh, to pick, so we have to work uh, with it and, and work it harder. Thank you. Tommaso, very shortly, um uh, with a question um to you uh, just a short reference how do you see the negativity of 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 civic space uh, um uh, uh having a, a negative effect on um, the, on the region um that uh, that's the question basically yeah well i i think it's definitely having an impact um the the first general comment is that it is becoming increasingly difficult i think for the eu to expect from its enlargement countries um and by international partners in general around the world a line of conduct that that the eu fails to respect within its borders um already i mean at first it was one or two countries that were deviating a bit from uh uh, from this, but as we see, uh, as um, Balaj and Val were saying, the the trends are are throughout the union, and anyway, there's more and more countries that uh, are restricting space uh, quite openly. Um, so it becomes very very difficult. And I I already in the past noticed when I was bringing partners from the Western Balkans to meet with Brussels officials, um, and you raise a, a very concrete specific problem. Uh, if it's in an area in which the EU or some EU member states don't have a good record, the EU officials tend to brush it away saying, well, I mean, even in the EU, we have this situation. One example uh, are um, NGOs commenting on uh, migration issues. I think this will become increasingly difficult with uh, a new wave of demonization for NGOs operating in the Mediterranean, uh, restrictions um, to the access that journalists have to, to comment on these things um what is happening in my own country italy in the past few weeks i think will have an impact on the way ngos and journalists comment on the balkan routes uh, in the western balkans um another area of course are our slaps uh, where luckily there is action now at eu commission level and in general there is a, a coalition of ngos you heard about it yesterday um that is trying to to bring to a directive uh but the fact that we see more and more in the eu these these slaps uh makes it uh, like is, is inspiring let's say leaders also on the ground in the western balkans to to do the same uh, and what we've seen with creek in serbia in the uh, recent weeks uh is quite a good example for this uh and i think looking at specific eu member states and the situation there as i briefly mentioned in my first answer uh the situation in hungary has had quite an impact on the western balkans uh, on serbia and republika srpska in, in particular given the proximity and the, the political affiliation and let's say the friendship between the leaders um and having commissioner varheli uh, also had an impact uh even though formally the commission and the engineer are addressing the problem of shrinking space um in reality problems with rule of law and other issues in Serbia, for example, have been swept under the carpet or anyway, let's say, phrased in a very, very vague way, um, because uh, Varheli doesn't have a, an interest in slowing down Serbia's progress uh, to join the EU. Luckily, he's facing a lot of resistance, in particular from the European Parliament, um, and we've seen even that this week um, a resolution uh, on this. But um, I, I would say that the change of mood has happened more because of the fact that Serbia didn't adopt sanctions against Russia rather than uh, because of the decline of human rights in the country. Um, and maybe last, very quick, is that I think the um, the war in Ukraine and the way this has impacted on how the EU sees Poland versus Hungary is something that is also uh, having some impact in the, in the Western Balkans. Uh, I think we have to be very careful at lowering criticism of certain countries just because we need them militarily or it's the same with Turkey actually and it can deliver the wrong messages I think um, the message that should come from what happened with Russia in the last year is that we um, we should actually stick to our values and uh, and let's say only do deals when countries actually commit to them thank you thank you for for the overview and for this last um uh, last input i think it, it is really uh, very uh, relevant to understand that 
the, the values are under pressure and for political trade-off uh and that is a jeopardy that is uh that, that is happening uh very um, um uh, very vividly um to conclude because we have five minutes because we um uh, we start five minutes um, um uh, later uh it's a really short question to all three of you uh what the EU can do to be better in uh, responding to shrinking civic space. Uh, please, if you can, phrase it in two to three recommendations. Balash, let's start with you. Okay, I will be very short. <clears throat> I think um, the first is on funding. Although you, I, I started with, um, you know, uh, how, how CERB is providing significantly more funding to NGOs, and that's great. At the same time, uh, you know, and this this will resonate with everyone uh, from the NGO field. While all responsible donors for the last years went from project funding to the direction of core funding, this is really not the case with the EU. So the EU is still, you know, the Commission still understands uh, mostly <laughs> project project funding, and they don't recognize that most of these NGOs, especially human rights watchdog, and especially. Uh, NGOs working on human rights issues, you know, need core or institutional funding in order to fulfill their watchdog roles. Even the best strategists and the best um, planners are not future tellers, and they won't be able to uh, predict uh, the exact number of abuses and the exact direction of uh, of you know uh, uh, things so you know uh, this this is a must they must understand that if they take the watchdogging role seriously they need they need this funding and the second you know i i uh, it would be lovely to uh, discuss this with wall and with others in in detail but i know i have to be a recommendation so it's very short i think um, we, re we reached a point uh, within the eu when we would need a high representative of the commission to serve as uh, as a you know kind of civic space uh, contact person you know probably uh, you know i don't know how we should call it civic space <laughs> uh, uh, high representative or 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 someone but with with real political leverage and real you know access to uh, to very high circles where civil society organizations can turn to with complaints and with issues so that that could be uh, done very easily uh, you know, that person could work with the fundamental rights agency uh, uh, again. You know, this is not about duplicating different roles. This is about giving uh, an actual prag practical, pragmatical, but also symbolic gesture and re recognize the importance of civil society in, in pursuing EU values. Thank you. Thanks, Balas, for concrete ideas and recommendations. Val? Yeah, where should I start? Ivan, I warned you that Balaj and I would be too aligned for a panel, but okay. Uh, I have some different perspectives, maybe. Um, I had prepared a lot of things. I think we could have a, a separate panel on you have, what should you, have, you have one minute. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. what should and could the EU do? There are a lot of things, but I, I think it boils down to one important thing that has been said in this panel. It's about strengthening civil society itself. And I think there's a lot of misunderstanding or un no, unclarity what this actually means. And I think we need to work much more as institutions on understanding what it means. And maybe I think also civil society needs to work a bit on what does it really mean to be a strong organization. Um, what is interesting is in the EU, when, when they speak about supporting civil society, they think only in financial terms. And I think that's important. Uh, and also how that's done is important, but we need to broaden what it means. Um, the, the upcoming report of the Commission will be, speak about protecting, supporting, and enabling civil society. Maybe we can work with that, I don't know. I have three concrete points. The first one um, is also on funding. <laughs> I think, um, and we are working both with the Commission SERF unit and with the EEA Norway grants on what does it mean to strengthen civil society. And of course, we work also with civil society on that. Uh, I think there are two points. The one is what do you fund? And the second is how do you fund? And in what do you fund? Uh, I think what we need to see is more intelligent funding. There is good, there is a lot of funding, but many donors, when they say we want to support civil society and then they fund service provision. 
It's not logical. Social services are important in many countries, but there is not enough funding for really the resilience of an organization, the capacity of organizations, the, uh, the well-being of staff, uh, the support when you work under pressure. So all of this, there needs to be more of that type of funding, more funding for advocacy, for watchdog activities, um, for coordination, for peer learning among civil society. There is hardly any projects that connect civil society across countries to learn together. So that's the funding. The second is civil dialogue. I mentioned this, the Article 11, 11 Treaty in the European Union. Uh, it must be more structured on how this is done. It must be more meaningful. It will require, again, some time, but also uh, skills by civil servants on how to actually do that. And the third point is, um, <laughs> um, Agency has included since a while in its recommendations on civic space that the EU should consider establishing something like an observatory on civic space. I think it aligns a bit with what you said, Balash, on some someone to turn to, someone who who looks uh, sort of methodologically consistently into these issues. Um, I think hand in hand with that would also go that the EU could produce EU internal guidelines on civic space, not just the external guidelines, but something for internally. I know that civil society is asking for a civil society strategy. I'm a bit skeptical on that, but maybe we can discuss that later in the discussion. But definitely there must be a more consistent strategic approach on how to support civil society very targeted and concretely beyond the funding. I think I would leave it at that for now, but I hope we have time for a little bit of discussion. Thank you, Val. Uh, we'll discuss all of these things, I'm sure, in the upcoming uh, events and days. Uh, I'll give now to Tommaso uh, to uh, uh, give in a minute uh, uh, two to three recommendations, please. Yes, perfect. Um, I think I will. I will mostly repeat what I said before. Um, when it comes to funding for the Western Balkans. I think the EU should look more into whether they want to support uh, organizations with institutional grants and look into whether all that bureaucracy is always necessary and invest more also in the European Endowment for Democracy, which I think is a great instrument for smaller organizations to um, to access funding. Um, for what concerns in general reports, I'll repeat also what uh, Balaj and Val said. Uh, language should be more direct and clear when it comes to the areas that need to be improved. No ambiguity that allows political leaders to twist. Uh, a very specific recommendation for EU delegations in the Western Balkans um, is to be more consistent and diligent and condemn publicly the pressures uh, that happen against human rights defenders, media and journalists. Uh, and to be more um, open and collaborate really regularly with civil society, uh, as I said, really step by step. Um, I think I think I can stop here, actually. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, I am sad that we don't have one more hour to work now on what you've um, uh, proposed, but the panels and especially online are uh, as they are, but I'm sure we have plenty of opportunity to uh, speak about that uh, at the conferences and then and and, and 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 events all across uh, the Europe. For our part, I know that that as a coalition of Croatian civil society, we will start uh, uh, having these conversations among ourselves and call you regularly to discuss it uh, with us. It is very important that we uh, that we have this broader European discussion happening not only on the European level but also on national levels um, um, as well. And just to add one thing to what uh, what you, Tommaso, was referring uh, for, I really do hope that soon we'll have the opportunity to to work alongside the colleagues from the Western Balkans countries uh, on issues of rule of law, fundamental rights, and that they will be able to use the uh, CERF programming um, as well to, to work on these issues. It is really important that we don't uh, create artificial um, uh, uh, divide between, uh, between us. This is particularly important for, for Croatian context. Thanks a lot for all of your valuable um, uh, inputs. Um, we will uh, continue, we'll now have a 10 minute um, uh, break and at 11.35 we will continue with um, the last, the fourth panel, panel of, of this uh, conference where we will be talking about civic 
um, initiatives in response to shrinking um, uh, uh, civic space. Uh, actually, we'll see um, we'll see uh, what various civil society organizations have been doing and what open uh, initiatives and idea are out there worthy to uh, support and to get um, uh, included in it. Val, Balash, Tomaso, thanks again, and looking forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Bye. Hello to all. <clears throat> Hello to all. My name is Marina. I come from Zagreb, from Solidarna Foundation, and I'm very honored to be here with you and to have this opportunity to uh, jump into the dynamic world of cooking, stirring, and spicing the new <laughs> EU strategy on creating a sus more sustainable environment for civil society, not only organizations, but for civic space, for active citizens, for citizens who care what is going to happen to our continent, biologically, climatically, and um, um, uh, ethically. So I'm very glad to be here and I thank our dear hosts for uh, giving me this opportunity and I'm very happy to be able to contribute to your discussion where I'm sure that my facilitation will uh, very soon be completely superfluous because today we have uh, very inspiring uh, introductory speakers and I'm sure that this group of people that is here will engage in a discussion. Uh, First, we will have introductory remarks. And then after that, uh, introductory remarks and a couple of questions that I will kind of suggest. And then uh, we will also have space for discussion. But throughout this session, you can use the Q&A option. For some of us, it's a new option. Okay, so there is a Q&A option. And inside there, you can ask your questions. You can pose your questions. And uh, we will uh, try to in, uh, throw them into the discussion periodically. So uh, uh, let me now uh, turn uh, to our guests. I'm very happy that I can uh, greet on behalf of the organizers, uh, amazing, three amazing women who are very compatible in what they do, even though they uh, operate from different geographical points on our continent, uh, but they are part of the same uh, community that is very seriously thinking through what kind of democracy we are living and what kind of democracy we are building as civil society agents across our continent. So greet with us uh, Jada Negri. Uh, she is leading the work on civic space at the European Civic Forum. And European Civic Forum, as many of you know, is a pan-European network of over 110 associations across 29 European countries, that means EU and beyond, working on equality, solidarity, and democracy for all. Europe ECF is our uh, really reliable partner in mapping out the uh, policy alerts and political train wrecks and mobilizing us around uh, common coalitions and advocacy initiatives. So thank you, Jada, for being here with us. Thank you. I'm happy to be with you. <laughs> then we have Marta Pardavi, uh, from the Hungarian Helsinki Committee, which is co-chairing. We all know who they are and how much trouble they have caused for the uh, self-oriented uh, and absorbed uh, rule makers like Orban. Uh, she is a lawyer by training and has been focusing on threats to the rule of law and civic space protection, not only in Hungary, but in the broader EU context. Uh, she is also uh, co-leads the Recharging Advocacy for Rights in Europe, a rare program, which equips human rights defenders to build stronger organizations and alliances for joint action. So uh, Marta is also a capacity building expert, which is extremely important for all of us. Anna, and here, Anna Fedas, 
uh, from Battery Foundation. And I have to open how to say, to expose myself. Anya Fedas is also very close associate of Solidarna Foundation. Hello, uh, Anya, it's nice to see you here. She is in charge of bilateral and regional cooperation in the scope of Active Citizens Fund, the national program in Poland, which is providing instrumental to support to human rights activists, watchdog organizations, advocacy coalitions that are dealing with most sensitive issues and are really providing the uh, life, uh, the life, life uh, and survival network for uh, active citizens in Poland that are resisting the oppression. So thank you, uh, dear women, for being here with us. And let's start. So we will start with Jada. And please, Jada, since you are so close to all information, can you please brief us what's happening with the now already mythical strategy, EU strategy to strengthen civic space, civil society organizations, to give us status and to give us dignity and more power to act. Where are we? What does it look like on paper? What does it look like in reality? What are the political gives and takes? And where do you see that now the social energy of civic uh, advocates is focusing and should be focusing? Uh, thank you, Marina. And uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me here. Uh, I'm really happy to join you. Um, so uh, let me take, first of all, a step, step back and connect to what you were discussing in the previous panel. So the European Union responses to uh, civic space, uh, to shrink in civic space. Today, the EU has unprecedented the tool to foster and protect, it, and protect democracy, rule of law and fundamental rights. We have uh, the European rule of law report, the serve funding program. We also have an upcoming uh, uh, European Commission report on shrinking civic space and a strategy on the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. These are all uh, great initiatives and there are many more that I could uh, uh, mention. But while these uh, uh, initiatives are important and acknowledge the important contribution that the civil society has for Europe and also the challenges that we face, the responses mostly address in a piecemeal uh, manner <laughs> the, the issue. There is uh, not, uh, we are missing an overarching strategic and comprehensive and coherent solution to what we are witnessing today, which not only aims at protecting civic space and civil society, but also engaging, supporting, and also in the, at the end, enlarging the space in which we operate. So this is where the call for a European civil society strategy comes from. And for me, it's important that uh, to stress that this was not a call just coming from Brussels, far away from uh, the, the burning issue of shrinking civic space, but really from the ground from Central and Eastern Europe, from organizations that witness and face and are at the fore forefront of, uh, this, uh, of, of the shrinking civic space. The idea is to have a policy container and uh, um, it can be called in many different ways, but uh, the, civil, the civil society strategy is the name that uh, was chosen to put all the legislative and non-legislative measures that the EU could take um, and should take to support, engage, and protect civil society. Um, after this uh, call emerged, uh, Civil Society Europe sent a letter to um, the president of the European Commission, uh, von der Leyen, in June. Uh, asking the Commission to put this issue in the agenda on, on in the working program of 2023. Um, 
we knew it was a long shot to ask for something that was absolutely not on the agenda of the European Commission, but really the idea was to raise the issue of civic space on the political agenda of the institutions. And uh, in uh, a couple of weeks, uh, we um, were able to mobilize over 350 organizations from all across Europe and all across different sectors to support this call. And this really shows the extent of the need and also the diversity of the need uh, that this strategy should, uh, should cover. And, uh, and this letter created some noise, <laughs> definitely inside the European Commission. Um, we also tried to um, involve not only, uh, of course, the cabinet of the president, but also uh, other commissioners that uh, don't work uh, specifically on rule of law and democracy, but uh, uh, need the civil society to push for their, <laughs> for their uh, political uh, agendas like environment, health. Um, so following this letter, we were invited by different cabinets uh, the cabinet of uh, Schuica, Jurova, and Reinders to meet. And, uh, and we really felt there is uh, a desire to do something on this issue right now. There is no willingness to have uh, a strategy because uh, the word strategy has a specific um, meaning inside the European Commission. Uh, for a specific policy uh, outcome. But uh, there is definitely an uh, interest uh, inside the Commission to do something concrete for civil society. And uh, they, they seem to have uh, open ears to hear what we want, what we need. So, and there are different policies that are coming up in the coming uh, months that uh, can include some of these concrete uh, uh, measures. We have the review of the European uh, Democracy Action Plan next year. We will have a new Defense of Democracy package, which also mentions in the work program will include the measures for uh, protecting civic space. We have the upcoming report on civic space, and we also have an initiative for a statute of European Association. So I think that there is a momentum. What we need now at the level of civil society is really to coordinate and strategize together. We have a lot of requests, a lot of demands, but it's important that we coordinate on what to push immediately and also uh, how we want to get ready for the European parliamentary elections in 2024, because this will be an additional uh, um, opportunity to, uh, to, to call for a more strategic uh, and overarching approach on civil society. So uh, from our side, we are calling uh, uh, civil society from uh, across Europe to join us uh, on 5 and 6 December in Brussels for, this, for a strategic reflection, exactly what uh, that we need but we don't only want to stay within civil society, we invited also resource persons from institutions, don the donors community, because we think that this uh, is a collective reflection and uh, it's important to build the bridges between uh, different, uh, from between civil society, but also with the, uh, different allies. Thank you. I will stop here and uh, thank, you very much for this overview. Uh, thank you very much for this overview. Uh, maybe if you can uh, just highlight whom do you see at this moment as our biggest allies, political allies? Um, I think that the, the Fundamental Rights Agency has been playing a very, very important role in uh, putting these uh, topic on the European agenda and also uh, explaining uh, 
in institutional terms uh, our demands, our needs. So I think this is the biggest ally, but inside the European Commission uh, and, and also the Parliament played a very, very important role with the, the report on civic space, the report on the Statute of, of European Associations, and uh, um, the work of committees that really have put this issue on the political agenda. But and the political groups in the Parliament, do we um, see some kind of, this is also the question also for Marta, of course, and for Anya at this point, where do you see, because as we know, because of the bipartisan nature, primarily, predominantly bipartisan in terms of two big groups and also other groups, we have to always look at what, how is EPP breathing? Because they are the bridging political party and sometimes act as cordon sanitaire also, when it comes to uh, center right and radical right, or we can translate it into democratic and anti-democratic actors. So maybe just a quick scan where we stand in terms of political support. So we have fundamental rights agency, which is extremely proactive, that is directly communicating with uh, Vice President Jourova for sure, that's for sure, with Libe committee. We have other committees in terms of political party groups and some uh, member states. Maybe it would be great to hear from Marta, from Mania also some inputs or from others, whoever would like to join in at this point. Marta. Okay, he hello everybody and thank you very much uh, Marina and, and, and uh, thanks Jada for, for this really uh, great update. Yes. Um, there is, there is quite a lot of challenges ahead of us. I think when it comes to all these individual um, developments that you had just listed, Jada, I wonder how many people in this audience or in similar audiences have the ability, right, to, to really follow this. And so, so this is exactly why we need these kind of events and also this kind of, of cooperation that, um, that already exists and should be expanded and broadened because not everybody has the ability to to follow everything at the same time but coordination uh, among the various um yeah allies and, and and actors is really important and what that means in practice can be sometimes very challenging and so i'd like to to talk about this a little um but first of all, I would start out that, um, yeah, you, you, Marina, you said cooking, stirring, and spicing. So, yes. Um, yes, so we have a lot of elements and ingredients um, that make up um, civil society and also the, the underlying uh, essential ingredients uh, for civil society. And, and we need to strengthen them and we need to actually make them more effective. But also there is something else, cooking, stirring and spicing, as you said, and it is a recipe a book. It's a whole recipe book. Others call it a playbook. And this is that of illiberalism, which yes. is um, very, very uh, well resourced, well coordinated. And this is something that, um, that has a, a, a single market, right, in the EU. And, and through the European institutions and the European framework, this kind of recipe is um, uh, quite easy to, to share and, and then to add the local flavors to it, if I can stick with this, um, with this picture. And then you, you can add you know, the local flavors and then you come up with basically uh, national variations of the same dish. In, the, in all of Europe, we have many similar dishes, but we all say, you know, this is our own, this is our own way of, of doing uh, minced meat wrapped in, in, in vegetables. Well, then this is what you have also when it comes to a liberal populism. It's something that um, just as, an, as a concrete example of transnational civil society cooperation on this subject, I can bring up how a few years ago, seems like quite a long time ago, we cooperated with Human Rights House Foundation, 
with the Helsinki Foundation for Human uh, Rights from Poland and also the Hungarian Civil, Society, uh, Civil Liberties Union and the Hungarian Helsinki Committee to look at what do these illiberal recipes look like in our own national settings. And we had a very uh, good report that not only described what's happening, we called them ill democracies, but also we had suggested a, uh, a set of very concrete actions, a toolkit to prevent and respond to this. And this is, I think, what we're talking about here too at the EU level. We know what these illiberal um, recipes taste like, and we need to actually get better at cooking, spicing and stirring our own. We have the ingredients, but these need to be put into a common pot because not only do we have a single market for this regressive policies, we need this, the protections of the single European space, the single European market for civil society space as well. And this is realized, I think, through a variety of ways and they all have to really fit well together. And in this respect, it's great to see that Basically, I think it's in the past year, but also maybe a little bit longer past two years that we're really, as you said, Jad, a moment, we're witnessing this momentum. So if we had talked about this issue two years ago, I don't think we would have had such a, a lengthy uh, category of, of you know, to do's to be looking out for in 2023. And at the same time, this topic and the complexities of it can seem daunting. And this is exactly one of the reasons why we need this transnational cooperation. Um, when, when, when I think about this topic, I will focus on human rights um, and human rights defending civil society. And I understand this very, very broadly, but um, not all um, units of civil society are facing the same challenges and not everybody is from across the EU space is facing the same challenges, of course. So we always have to be mindful of the, the variations and the diversity and diverse situations and, and context that um, civil society groups operate in, depending on, on whether, whether you're an informal student protest group in Hungary or a formal human rights advocacy organization like mine in Hungary, you also will have different challenges. And so, um, but our challenges, both types of organizations will be quite different from those organizations that work on, for example, um, uh, providing social care um, and, and, you know, in the field of, of culture, for example, there are illiberal pressures in all of these fields, but specifically the organizations that come mostly under attack and are seeing some, you know, very clear, uh, tangible symptoms of shrinking civic space are the ones that do advocacy. So I think advocacy, basically the idea that citizens should have a say in public affairs this very core notion of democracy is coming under attack. So it's not civil society in general. It is our participation, our right to participate, to, to be heard, to be involved, to, to put forward ideas is coming under pressure. And so this is very rightfully not, shouldn't be seen as a separate topic, this civic space, but rather as part of, a, of, 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 of issues related to democracy and also rule of law. And so it is exactly on, the, on this basis, I think, that we need this, this realization that there needs to be European, pan-European and E-level action. Because if, we're, if we know that we have democracy issues in the EU, and these are being addressed through EU-level policies, and we know that we have rule of law issues, right? And we have now a pretty developed toolkit as it's being rolled out. Why, why cannot we have something that is so inherent? How can we have democratic institutions, rule of law protection without citizens who are acting, monitoring, representing? So I think from this point of view, it's pretty logical to ensure this space. And also we can talk a lot about um, in the discussion about how this can look like at various levels. But I can tell you one more thing. This will be my last thought here. Isn't this wonderful that it's a bunch of Croatian organizations um, bringing 
everybody today together on this issue. This is the kind of input we need. So this is why um, we, we in the Recharging Advocacy for Rights in Europe program are wanting to get more uh, national level or local human rights defending organizations involved in discussing this topic because we need support and realization from everywhere around the EU. And um, thank you for, for, for initiating this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marta, for uh, condensing and uh, combining so many interesting insights in such a structured manner. I would like to maybe just pick uh, at this point on one thing that I think is very important that you highlighted and that we can really now link with what Jada was talking about to proceed. And that is that the protection of civic space and empowerment of European citizens to consume and exercise their civic rights, yeah, is something that is a matter, a core matter of the functioning, not only of our value space, if we talk about liberal and that is the certain set of values that are connected with how we interrelate with each other, but also it's a constituting tool, a tool for the practice both of the rule of law and the very tool for the practice of democracy. So we are closing some kind of a triangle between liberal values democratic practices and democratic norms and procedures and rule of law as a matter of not to say security. Rule of law is our tool to ensure safety and security at individual, corporate, group and social level. So in a way, uh, the question would be yes, and we need to proceed. And while you were speaking, I was thinking about how what I see personally as a biggest shift from pre and post or crisis mode of operation, what have we learned through the crisis that we went through when the whole uh, ill democracies project uh, was done, because I remember it was 2016, very important year for all of us. Now, a little bit earlier, yeah, at that time now when we look five, seven years later, big difference is I think that uh, we cannot ignore the social economic realities, we cannot ignore the frustration of European citizens who feel completely alienated, who feel degraded, and that we have to take seriously what we have learned from populists in terms of remarrying issues related to values, quality of life, democratic power, and uh, changing lives on the periphery. As you mentioned, so thank you for uh, complimenting Croatia on the periphery for raising these issues. Yes, this is this issue of center and periphery and becoming much more aware about center issues around sense of security and belonging when it comes to uh, citizens. So uh, going back to Jada, yes, how to integrate it? This is what Marta is the challenge, how to integrate it into the European policy framework as a whole and not to have a small ghetto called civic protection space, yeah? We need to mainstream it because it is a, a tool civic participation and advocacy are tools for, re, for our sustainability. So Jada, how close are we to that? Knowing that we have European uh, a, a democracy plan, action plan, the strategies are on the horizon. We also have other processes. So how closely, how can we see this move? And Marta also from Hungarian experience, because you have worked a lot on advocacy all together to integrate issues of civic space inside rule of law reports and monitoring. So maybe if you could comment a little bit on that, how close are we to this political mainstreaming? Also, Anya, please just join in. Um, there you go. <laughs> yes, uh, I don't know. Maybe I leave first the word to Anya, uh, given that uh, she hasn't mm -hmm. spoken, and then uh, I I jump in to respond to your question. Okay. Um, 
Thank you, uh, Gada, and uh, thank you uh, all the organizers, panelists, uh, you, Marina, for uh, for this wonderful uh, facilitation. I would maybe continue the metaphor of cooking and the playbook. I I think that uh, it um, helps a lot to explain, but also understand what is going on and how we can we uh, counteract this. Uh, so. Uh, I would speak from the uh, Polish uh, civil society organizations perspective that are um, all the time learning this to read the playbook and try to like um, with their um, with their activities to uh, to somehow counteract it. So uh, first, uh, when the um, as you as Marta said, ill democracies uh, tendency uh, tendencies um, uh, started to be more and more visible in Poland, uh, civil society organizations went into the first layer as I. Uh, um, uh, as I like, I would say um, structured it. So it was just the resistance. Uh, so we disagreed for the changing the educational uh, statue and rules, uh, and and we wanted as civil society organizations uh, to be able to deliver um, uh, if, uh, informal education in the schools, also in so-called underserved areas. But we are now fighting all the time, fighting to fi fighting to uh, to have this right. So we build this coalition of over thirty um, civil society organizations called um, the Network uh, of Intervention. Uh, the same happened when the uh, asylum seekers uh, tried to uh, get to Poland through Belarusian um, border. We also created uh, the. Um, so-called Grupa Granica, the border group of organizations that struggle with the same. They are all the time, uh, there's a threat to be accused of uh, helping asylum seekers to, to illegally cross the border and, and being um, punished and also uh, uh, threatened by the uh, the police or 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 or, milit uh, or army polish army the same happened when there was covid the same happened when the, uh, there was the um, um hosting and and trying to fill the gap uh, of uh, lack of uh, um, state answer to the refugee uh, support from ukraine in poland all um, civil society organizations were there and we're finally able to uh, to join forces. So the uh, so I I would say that that's the first layer of resistance. Now we are trying and learning a bit uh, with our Polish spices and flavors a bit uh, the um, the to build networks. Um, not because there is a threat. Not because uh, we are. Um, we have to fill the gap that it's not filled by the state or municipalities or others, or because we care about values, about people, about ecology, about rule of law. And the second layer would be to act because it's uh, it's uh, more uh, more sustainable, because it's more efficient, because it makes more sense, especially when it comes to the um, um, to the values we are uh, uh, trying to. We are taking care. So uh, this this example would be the uh, first uh, the the rule of law report, the common contribution to the rule of law report, and we learned that the, from the Hungarian uh, organization. So it's also the uh, in uh, the know how uh, influx and know how uh, sharing. Uh, um, so it's not like only the illiberal democracies tendencies are being shared and being followed, but also this positive answers to that. And I would say this year we are more open to uh, extend our network of organizations delivering um, common contribution. We are no longer competing and we understand better how how to use this mechanism and uh, uh, and the second the second layer also is means that we know how to use the mechanism of uh, my, uh, monitoring committees uh, as you know in the resilience and recovery plans we in Poland of course we don't still don't uh, have the 
the plan accepted and the, the negotiations are uh, still there because of the ill democracy, by the way. But what is important and what we are proud of that we are now using this element of monitoring committee of the national recovery plan uh, um, smarter and we shared and joined for the forces and shared based on our competences also uh, on the fact where we are regionally um, situated we use this mechanism to uh, um, um, uh, to to uh, be prepared but also to be uh, uh, wisely uh, um, and structured uh, to, to give the uh, wise and structured answer uh, and to be protect the uh, the local democracy in this uh, committee uh, uh, monitoring committees so this would be the uh, um, the oldest um, positive examples would be the second layer and the third layer that we are still in my opinion of course not there to uh, also use the instrument that are ahead jada did a wonderful overview and always like like to listen what's there what is going going to be cooked soon so uh so i think this proactively using the opportunities uh and uh, also in the advocacy matters but also in like um trying to uh foretell what there would would be there uh, and and to pre be prepared and also have this enough resources to react so it's not like the uh, um, um the european level will be always the the only only dedicated for those who know uh, the 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 issues are well uh, informed but also for those um uh, who who know how to use it and are there uh, locally to deliver the uh, the voice uh, from the grassroots level to the european level so this this channel between the european level and the local level um is being tested and used uh, more often than just you know uh, when there is this um, uh, threat or when there is something um, uh, the 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 the, um, the 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 rule of law is for example in danger or the 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 women rights are in in, in danger so i would say that uh, the third layer is still like um, ongoing process for us and when it comes to learning and structuring and uh, strategizing and I'm just, uh, that's my last, last sentence, last, last point. Uh, I'm, um, I'm joined to you right after our regular monthly uh, active citizens fund operators meeting. We meet once a month. And thanks to pandemic, by the way, we started meeting regularly and once a month uh, instead of one time a year. And thanks to that, we can uh, follow and monitor regularly the, this illiberal democracy trends. And what I um, uh, heard from Bulgarian case is that, again, they have this attempt to, um, to have the um, foreign agents um, law uh, introduced. And they, again, um, shared the um, need that actually this, uh, th they see uh, how the, um, um, the European uh, state you for associations would be also, and then the process of recognizing civil society organizations at the European level will help them to also deliver the debate inside the country about the, the matters uh, the, the of uh, civil society organizations. So this is also would be an example how it's not all the time the um, button up, but it could be also um, used uh, 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 top down. So that's for me for now. So, uh, and I'm really um, looking forward for your questions and, and also reflections. Thank you, Anya, but maybe just a little bit of uh, just a, a little spicing it up. What is your impression at the moment in Poland, considering for how long the resistance lasts, how many waves there are, and now with the Ukrainian crisis and this general sense of insecurity, which for sure uh, uh, uncertainty that must be felt, how are you maintaining within civil society, but also in the public uh, space, in the media space and among citizens, how do you sustain, uh, how to say, uh, focus and uh, motivation to keep attention on the trends in this sense? Uh, you know, how, how does this interplay work? Mm -hmm. 
So very briefly, because I can talk about uh, threats uh, for human rights and things that worries me. More, in more about your your, your capacity to uh, maintain focus. Yeah, you know? of course. There is, of course, uh, too many um, fronts opened, too many fights, too many battles uh, opened uh, now. Uh, so it's really hard to follow it. That's why. Again, we need to to be uh, better prepared and organized because it's not like everyone are following everything. Um, for sure, we have a, uh, the the first, the biggest threat is the uh, upcoming elections, and the fact that politicians and they are all already doing it, and also right wing organizations, they will use the. Uh, the, situ uh, the economic crisis, uh, the, the inflation, uh, and also the fact that uh, um, uh, the um, support for Ukrainian refugees is not yet solved. And when it comes to the uh, systemic approach, uh, I'm not talking again about the answer that civil society gave. I, I'm talking about the uh, sustainable, like I would say, long-term uh, systemic approach. So it's not there. And because of that, it's very really easy to use the frustration of citizens, uh, again, uh, of course, against uh, the newcomers, the refugees. And we are, as uh, civil society organizations, uh, taking care of the people with refugee and migrant background. We're really wor worried. We had already the, the acts of, uh, of anti-Ukrainian, uh, um, um, I would say, initiatives or statements on protests. Uh, it's really minor now, but I know that, and we feel that, that uh, it's it's going to happen. So we have to be prepared for this information, uh, uh, the, for the, uh, the, fra the narrative that is um, uh, racist, that is uh, uh, ag uh, against those who are already here. So it's really also uh, worry worrying about the, the, the um, personal attacks, but also the uh, violence on the street. So that's why we are uh, we are not there to, to prepare it because it's happening so uh, so quick. And at the same time, we are as civil society organizations are delivering. Uh, the basic uh, support, humanitarian support are uh, still like taking care of the things that are not uh, taken care of. The, and that would that would be the one, the biggest. And also the um, per, uh, uh, dedicated attack to certain organizations. And that's again, that's why we need coalitions because being together, it's uh, it means that we won't be targeted individually. And now uh, many organizations are afraid to be targeted um, especially organizations from uh, um, outside big cities uh, it, where activism is very visible. Uh, so that's why it's it's still not there to protect ourselves, to be, uh, um, to be prepared for sl uh, slaps attacks or smear campaigns. And I think we are, uh, this is something that we know that will happen uh, because it's happening all the time, but not in a big scale. And uh, and I think this uh, awareness is also a bit paralyzing and has this chilling effect because there are too many uh, um, too many as I said battlefields open and um, so yeah so I would so very briefly but worrying and without any solutions so far about, about uh, apart from the fact that we are discussing about it and um, and uh, trying to uh, uh, to somehow. Uh, find out any solution ahead, ahead for that. Uh, Thank you very much, Anya. Uh, a, a little follow follow up, both for you and for Marta, and that relates to uh, to um, resistance outside big cities, because it seems to us that both in Hungary and in uh, Poland. Uh, there are remarkable local initiatives that are really community driven and that are not directly supported by, by big organizations or networks or think tanks, that they can really stem out of some local social 
spaces in which uh, people are critical, active, and want to express their uh, ideas of a different vision of a community, especially when remember those LGBT zoning uh, and the way and how creatively those communities responded. Uh, it seems to us that we can learn a lot about it and then that in many parts of Europe, especially also in Croatia, we do suffer from centralization. Uh, and that even when we talk about this strategizing at the EU level, it is really hard sometimes to catch and to give space, enough space to the different realities in smaller communities, in communities uh, that cannot afford to care and follow EU level of politics because they are just managing to get by with their own local, you know, um, how to say, autocrats and so on. So a little bit of comment, please spice it up with some maybe uh, uh, some uh, optimistic practices that can encourage us in terms of, uh, you know, grassroots situations. Um, I'm, I'm happy to offer some thoughts, but I, I think I'll rely also on um, on Anna because uh, because of the active citizens funds, which absolutely have a have a focus and a component on this. Sadly, though, not in Hungary because I'm sure you're all aware that uh, the Norway EA grant um, is not available in Hungary. This is not the fault of the donor, but of the Hungarian um, government, which just simply would not accept an independent operator. And so this support to civil society, which was, I think, very crucial um, for local smaller organizations, local and smaller organizations, um, was, uh, um, it's, it's no longer out there. But one of the important things, and we always have to come back to this, is absolutely resources and, and, and funding. And um, I know that uh, many private donors and even uh, new public uh, donors on the horizon or being rolled out are available and have become, um, uh, yeah, become partners in trying to to disperse funds in a way that is accessible. So, for example, the Surf program has uh, has such a, a a feature, and it will be also in Hungary rolling out through a Hungarian consortium. A very um, capable organizations and hopefully will be able to to provide financial support. Financial support is really important. Um, it's not, you know, it's 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 never um, uh, overstated, but it has to be accessible and manageable. So when um, you have an endless amount of paperwork and administration for a couple of thousand euros, it really can drain resources. And um, and so in this respect, this is another reason why it's important to have co um, cooperation among various organizations. It's to be able to address the, the management burden and also the compliance uh, responsibilities and also the build up capacity to, to, to handle um, funds, manage funds in a, in a compliant but effective way. But also because this is a way to also become involved in, in important conversations and, and developments in a, in a sort of a sectoral development and learning uh, path uh, by not having to assume all these tasks yourself. So in Hungary, this is certainly an endeavor. We have a, a, a coalition of Hungarian NGOs that was that's uh, basically took its roots from 2014, but it was formally um, established in 2017, and it still is very active. It's called Civilizatio, and it has, I'm sure many of you have heard of this, and it has a number of members, but mostly in Budapest, but certainly it is an intention and it is happening already to involve organizations that are outside of Budapest, and they're doing great work, but also, um, need to 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 become more visible, and so a coalition can also bring visibility. It can bring resources. It can bring capacity, and it can also bring the issues that um, from from the Brussels level down to a 
to 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 everybody around the EU space and also then pick up messages and and demand um, that should be uh, better represented in in um, in harder to reach uh, fora. And so this has many advantages. But at the same time, I know that even those organizations in Hungary, and this goes for everybody, regardless of the physical seat, that have um, that have been um, uh, doing great work, but they are targeted for this, are facing a lot of challenges, which sadly will not be fixed by building up, as it's often said, the resilience of civil society organizations. So uh, there's very often a uh, one hears a thinking that by strengthening civil society organizations, they will be able to push back against the pressures of illiberal uh, democracies or or uh, democratic erosion. This is a, this is a key ingredient, but it cannot be the only one. So this is a, a, a joint a responsibility and a joint. Um, a task for many other sectors, foremost um, political structures, but also generally citizens, um, actors in the private sector, everybody has a stake in this. So very often when we talk about, you know, preventing, um, I don't know, yeah, building up the resilience of civil society organizations, we focus on, on putting um, a, a lot of responsibility on the weight of very small groups. They together, even if we band together, cannot undo something in the case of Hungary, for example, that is done by a super well-resourced, most uh, well-coordinated um, initiative, which has the legislative power, the executive power and so on. And so it takes a lot more um, effort a lot more organizations, a lot more actors and sectors to band together. Civil society can also provide a lot of impetus for this and 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 a glue um, and and some clarity in this process. But I really think that um, that we cannot, you know, just look at how can we build up organizations and forget about the rest. This goes back to the original idea that I was talking about. This really has to be seen as part of our democracy um, efforts, and 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 we have to not only look at the symptoms, but really the the core of these issues. Thank you, uh, Marta, very much, especially because you pointed out also to these uh, structural issues and also the responsibility of the donor community, including the European Union, but also the European uh, economic space, including uh, Kingdom of Norway, when it comes to the funding regimes, the expectations, and something that we can call sharing responsibility for uh, sharing responsibility and maybe renegotiating externalities. Who is responsible for the uh, impact? Who is responsible for the risks? that are undertaken along the road. And uh, it seems to me personally that this really tight dialogue between uh, EU institutions, especially the Fundamental Rights Agency, but also uh, some other fora and civil society is extremely important, especially when donors are also included in terms of really putting it on the table that if we are talking about resilience and resistance, that, that also requires change of behavior and readiness to adjust our cultures to the new realities at all levels and readiness to step out of the comfort zone. Uh, so in that uh, respect, but readiness to use the tools that we have learned that we really have to be ready. We need to, how to say, we need to be ready to take care of ourselves and act because nobody else is going to do it for us. And in this way, maybe the last question, and now we are coming to the last uh, part of our uh, uh, meeting, and there will be open space for participation from the audience uh, uh, in our forum. The question is, okay, when we are talking about building resilience, as you mentioned, Marta, 
extremely important thing is not to overload and have too high expectations of groups that are acting in very uh, challenging environments. The important thing is to have reasonable uh, accounting and reporting expectations that are not creating administrative uh, uh, overburden for activists and where accountability is uh, managed in ways that are not damaging uh, to advocacy capacities. We all know it's a big mantra. It's a very important one. We hope, and this is important to see, whether the new package this CERF program, CERF, how it is actually reflecting the priorities expressed in civic protection reports. And whether it seems to me it will be very important to monitor it closely in this first pilot pack to see because there might be space for <laughs> adjustment because we do not need another extremely exhausting uh, mechanism. I see you are all nodding. Uh, so let's move. So we are talking about funding regimes. We are talking about uh, donor policies. Uh, we are talking about a uh, more participatory approach to uh, grant uh, management in general, the role of support and big organizations, their responsibility in respect to uh, uh, smaller organizations or more vulnerable, uh, more exposed, let's say more exposed. Uh, social movements as well, especially uh, uh, solidarity movement with people on the move, yeah? Uh, but now let's move more to the smaller ac action level. Can we, uh, are there some tools, approaches, especially when it comes to enhancing and sustaining collective, collective advocacy movements, transnational, are there some um, practices on the horizon or some tools that we need to be discussing more fervently uh, based on your experiences on what works, how to sustain and build capacity of our civic space to protect, to expand, to engage citizens and to influence uh, political and social realm. Anything um, else that you would like to uh, highlight? Um, I'm 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 happy to to offer some ideas on this. So, how to expand the capacity of organizations such as the ones who are organizing this uh, webinar uh, to take part more in the whole um, yeah. civic space uh, uh, promotion and strengthening um, initiative. So, one thing. Is of course information, and this is this is key. Uh, it's I think really important uh, to have actors like uh, the European Civic Forum that really co focuses on this topic specifically and can share information. But what we have noticed is um, uh, that uh, information uh, is crucial but it's not enough because people really still see that this is happening somewhere remotely far away um, in Brussels and this is not related to the sort of Brussels bubble bashing but really it's just we never engaged with it it's just far away it's far from our own reality why why should I guess a lot of uh, organizations would think why should I bother because it's just too distant too complicated and so this is a general challenge of the European Union and to bring it closer to citizens and to bring citizens closer is really imperative because otherwise it's very easy to hijack and to 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 um, bad mouth it. Um, not being naive about the, the ability of an organization from from Zagreb or Budapest to really set the agenda, but by participating and increasing our own visibility, we have to be taken into account. And I think this is the key issue. And so this is one of the things that we're hoping to um, to to strengthen through the this rare program, the recharging advocacy, because what we've noticed is that it's not that difficult to really have meetings and discussions in Brussels once you know how to do it and once you have friends, partners, colleagues, basically showing you how to do it. And so 
by making these very personal connections and, and introductions and showing what the, are the tools, what are the, the ways to interact, this, this helps a lot. Also, there's some very basic things that organizations that are focused at, at EU level advocacy, policy advocacy are very um, conversant in, but not necessarily working in a different reality. So for example, just skills building when it comes to policy paper writing, this is not something that is um, that one is born with. It's a skill that can be developed and it can be put to use in any scenario, right? Um, but not something that uh, we would necessarily do. So this is something to also talk about. Anya, you mentioned the monitoring committees. Um, how civil society should really participate in monitoring how EU funding is spent, particularly now in the recovery and resi resilience uh, programs and, and, and to contrast the commitments undertaken in plans to the actual implementation, but in general for the, for the EU budget. Now, I think this is a big gap for many organizations and sectors, so not to... Um, I'm sure there's there's great organizations out there, but when it comes to the human rights space and the democracy um, space, I am not sure how many organizations are really um, well equipped with knowledge and capacity to participate in this process. So it's not enough to know about human rights, but it's also you need to know how programming works in the European Union, how what kind of rules apply to public spending. The same goes for um, the, the, the challenges we have here in Hungary about anti-corruption efforts. Um, even if, if they are genuine, it's very important to, to keep an eye and hold government accountable for this, but you need to have quite a lot of technical expertise in this. So bringing together, for example, organizations and institutions that know how funding cycles work and what are the, the, the strategies and, and, and the development of, of these funding programs with organizations that want to participate in making sure that they're spent the right way on the right purpose is something to do. And I don't know whether this link exists. It's also a capacity building challenge. So there's quite a lot that can be built up that can be used for EU related issues on the civic space um promotion agenda but also just in general for every day and i think it's really worth investing because by by building up capacities we become uh, much more uh, self-confident and this is partly i think the, the issue when it comes to engaging with the european union Thank you. Thank you, Marta, and thank you for uh, uh, pointing our attention to the institutional channels that are already there, but there is a question how useful they are and how much capacity we have to use them. I'm personally a, a survivor of maybe four years of serving on the monitoring committee for the European Social Fund in Croatia, and I can say as an insider that uh, the culture, the, the whole that it is very, <laughs> that it is, uh, that these uh, institutions are very often co-opted in, um, in a, I would say, ritualistic culture of dialogue uh, between the European Commission and national governments on how the, uh, the, how the implementation proceeds and that uh, it is not so easy, even if we are well organized inside those monitoring committees, to have impact greater than building greater trust with some institutions and trying to influence some smaller technical issues. But we have not managed to stabilize the pace of calls. We have not managed to get out of the bunker several calls focused on governance and anti-corruption issues in Croatia. So just to say, Anya, I would love to hear your answer. But I would say, Marta, yes, 
it would be extremely useful to try to share experiences and see whether there are some tactics that are needed, especially because monitoring committees never manage to get access to decision makers at the commission level higher than desk officers or, God forbid, heads of unit. Anya. Very briefly, I just wanted to uh, continue what Marta started to, mm -hmm. to list. Uh, I just wanted to add that um, actually um, the um, the the, bo the bodies uh, like, for example, Euro um, um, Euro Econo European Economic Social Committee that we also uh, wrote an analysis on how the uh, the nomination to this uh, body uh, are uh, is done is being done uh, in various countries, and it looked like really um, it has to be improved. But many organizations are not aware that. They, they can actually apply they they get to know about it when there was uh, there is scandal about the, the nomination procedure being um, somehow corrupt or hij hijacked or something uh, but actually um, maybe now they will be more prepared to take care of of this also uh, when there will be another election so i'm mean that I just wanted to show that we are also learning, of course, uh, uh, step by step, and also sometimes crises help us to uh, to organize and to uh, to to be aware of some uh, of 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 uh, the the threats, but also the instruments that we we can use um, in the future and be more prepared for for uh, to be. Uh, uh, wisely using it, um, the pro Ma Marta mentioned also capacity building, and I'm uh, uh, um, I'm proud of being the the alumni of the Recharging Advocacy for Rights in Europe program that is also uh, that that Marta uh, is in charge of, and I wanted to just uh, share that this kind of initiatives help not only to net um, to network but also to gain the skills that we can't uh, learn at in schools. Uh, at, I can speak for Polish schools, uh, like writing policy papers or uh, or also uh, sh uh, framing the uh, the um, um, the aims uh, and also like uh, trying to also be, like uh, see the few steps uh, of our activities ahead. So th this kind of attempts to help, but I think it should uh, it's it's uh, still not not enough, and maybe we can we have to think of how to spread it. So uh, so not only the usual suspects will uh, will be there, but also to spread it and mainstreaming uh, mainstream it uh, as as you mentioned around uh, other organizations that uh, that now think maybe that's too complicated. That's uh, experts should should take care of it, but they are actually expert practitioners, and they uh, there should be also place for uh, for them. Thank you. Jada. Yes, if I can build on what Marta and Anya just said, um, I think that the capacity building is extremely important, but it's also important to explain to the donors that, uh, uh, and I liked what uh, you were saying, Marina, it's not just about uh, learning uh, new, having new knowledge, new information, knowing better how to be positioned in Brussels and so on. It's also about having the capacities, meaning human resources to do this. Because the problem that yeah. I see uh, is that, uh, um, and maybe it's what uh, Marta was also uh, suggesting before, is that when we talk about uh, building resilience, building capacities, but we of the same people. <laughs> we are limited biologically <laughs> and, and neurologically. And yeah. uh, <laughs> so, um, and uh, this uh, connects with another topic that I feel is uh, is really really uh, important and uh, um, uh, really makes me passionate, which is culture of care. Like mm -hmm. and uh, like we have been uh, within civil society uh, extremely constantly mobilized for the past three years over a constant. Uh, uh, emergencies and uh, this is really an issue of uh, um, sustainability of the sector because the 
the, the resources, meaning the people <laughs> that really responded to this uh, to this crisis, are uh, drained and are on the verge of burnout or already burned out. And uh, uh, the, uh, I was uh, two weeks ago in Florence and I was holding a space on this issue. And uh, uh, it was amazing how much needed this space was, how much vulnerable people um, were, <laughs> even though we were all strangers, how much uh, trauma we hold in our bodies on this, uh, but uh, it's not just a personal mental health issue, it's really a structural issue of the, uh, of the system, uh, of, of, of a destruct <laughs> of civil society and resilience, and the donors have uh, um, uh, uh, really a role to play. And uh, I just want to say, sometimes uh, I, I'm scared when I hear um, that uh, we, we talk about the mental health as an additional um, uh, thing to do <laughs> for the donors. I think it's really important that uh, um, there is a proper reflection of how to bring real support, which means not just adding an additional request to the organizations, but really yes. supporting them in organizing the work and uh, mobilizing the citizens, more citizens, and uh, sustaining these mobilizations. So uh, I think that we really need to have a uh, to also rebalance the relationship between donors and civil society, because I think it's also an imbalance of power that uh, uh, that uh, that we need to to rediscuss. Um, and uh, I, I will finish here, but uh, I hope we will have uh, more opportunities to continue to continue this conversation. Thank you, Jada, for uh, uh, now closing and just bringing this perspective, which is extremely, I mean, I think it's central and close to our hearts. So moving from uh, anxiety about how to find time to care at individual group level to uh, uh, optimism about changing cultures and structures towards politics of care so that we actually change the way we view care uh, as a resource and as an ethical choice also. So thank you, it is ex extremely important and I think that it's so, uh, Anya, uh, please, uh, I, I cannot resist to ask you to comment on this one and you already raised your hand because Jada was a little telepathic, I would say. Yeah, actually, uh, we uh, we I I think we share the same uh, uh, some part of the brain with Jada because and also when it comes to sensitivity uh, in yeah. September this year together with uh, uh, Marina and other fund operators uh, we organize anti burnout solutions camp for our project promoters of the Active Citizens Fund and actually it was all about this and we got to the point that actually we can't take care of democracy or of law if, if we can't take care of ourselves and democracy in our organizations and also uh, um, how we treat our bodies our minds and also uh, uh, pro um, grants uh, the donors were with us and I think that's also the a way we should also think that uh, together with donors we are like we are uh, we have bigger forces and actually we somehow can change this uh, system so it's step by step we have to start with ourselves <laughs> uh, because for us it's now still on the task, li task list task list but it should be part of the system and um, and just that that's very close uh, comment on that because it's close to our heart. Thank you. So thank you all. We are coming to a close and we are caring about our resources and we will try to stick to uh, time. Uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and for your, uh, how to say, easiness of conversation uh, and all the insights. Uh, and thank uh, you, Ivan, also as our main organizing for this opportunity to Engage, and I pass on the farewell words to you. And thank you very much to all our listeners. 
today or any time when this uh, re recording flies through virtual space. Thank you for uh, being with us and thinking about democracy, active citizenship, and future and safety of our communities. Thank you, Marina, for uh, inspiring uh, uh, moderation of this um, final panel. And then to your panelists, I'm looking forward to seeing you soon, Anna and, um, and Marta and Jada, you as well, uh, in, 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 in two weeks. Um, well, it's been two mornings of conversation about uh, problems that we see in, in civic space, about a uh, particular issues that we are all facing in, in, in different countries, about um, um, commonalities, about negative trends uh, that we see on the EU level, but also, but also in our neighboring in the Western Balkans. But more than that, there's been a lot of talk about what we can uh, do jointly together. There's been a lot of talk about uh, um, uh, hope and 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 uh, and um, prospect of future um, uh, cooperation. And that's, I think, are um, the uh, two main ingredient ingredients in dishes that you were referring to uh, that we need to uh, counter um, what is happening with civic space in the European Union. And I really hope and believe soon to take the initiative to bring up the opening of civic space even further because I strongly believe that the best way to preserving the standard is by expanding it even, um, even, um, um, uh, even further. I won't go to uh, uh, main, uh, um, main uh, uh, points or conclusions for, for every panel. For that, we were recording this, uh, this whole conference and we will, um, uh, we will produce some uh, conclusions and, um, and, and notes for all of you um, um, uh, to, to have it because this is a joint advocacy uh, work in, uh, in, in the future. Um, at the end, um, I just wanna say, uh, Thanks to all of you who participated and listened to us for these two mornings. Many thanks to all of the um, uh, panelists who were very responsive and willingly uh, 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 and willfully joined the um, uh, this, uh, of course, willingly willfully joined this uh, this uh, the, this conference and and discussion. It was um, a pleasure uh, having us um, um, uh, having you with um, uh, with us. Thank you to all of the um, moderators um, uh, as well. A special thanks always goes to um, our uh, interpreter, Bashkim. Thanks again for being with us, for bearing for these um, uh, two mornings, Aaron, and for uh, um, uh, interpreting what we were saying in English into um, uh, Croatian. And at the end, thanks to um, my colleagues, Sara, Jelka, Sven, uh, and uh, uh, Cieta, uh, who um, managed uh, um, and who were, who were forced behind this conference um, um, uh, happening. I'm sure we will be convening some, some similar activities like this um, uh, in the future, and um, we will take active participation in bringing solutions for closing civic space uh, in, um, uh, on the EU level. Thank you. Have a nice uh, rest of the day, lovely weekend, and I guess bon appetit with the spices that we collected from the last session. <laughs>